Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. So this session today is on the new points-based immigration system and recruitment practices. And despite the fact that the Brexit transition period won't end until the 31st of December, applications for certain routes under the new points-based immigration system will open on the 1st of December, which is now just under a week away. So just last week, the policy guidance was published on the skilled worker route um, just a couple of weeks before the rule changes are coming into force just to keep us on our toes. So hopefully now is a good time to recap on what's changing when the new real rules are introduced. So the agenda for today, Erin's going to provide an overview on the key changes to the skilled worker route and the intra-company transfer route. And then she'll cover some of the start dates for when the new routes will open. I'll then highlight some things to think about in terms of reviewing your recruitment practices to take account of the end of the Brexit transition period, the fact that there isn't labour market test will no longer exist under the skilled worker route, and also to take account of the new graduate route. And I'll finish up by looking at some of the ways in which the new rules will impact internships. Thanks, Elaine. So as mentioned, I'm going to start off by doing a quick overview of the new rules and the main changes coming into play, and also when these changes come into force. So first I'm going to talk about who can apply under the new rules and when. So the new system officially comes into effect on the 1st of December 2020, which is less than a week away, and applications under the rules will be uh, open from that date. Applicants from the EEA can't uh, be granted entry clearance under the new route until the 1st of January 2021, and that's the same for their family members who may want to switch into the category as well, even if they aren't European. This is because they will still be able to enter under the free movement rules of the transition period up until the 31st of December, and then they'll be able to qualify to remain in the UK through the EU settlement scheme in most cases. Non-European applicants can apply and be granted entry, entry clearance from the 1st of December, so that's next week. Um, and because that's coming so quickly, there are some transitional arrangements in place. So if sponsors have issued a certificate of sponsorship before the 1st of December date, but the sponsorship won't begin until after the 1st of December or the 1st of January, whichever date applies, um, a sponsor note should be added to that certificate of sponsorship to upgrade it to one under the skilled worker rules rather than the tier two rules. Um, and also, Anyone applying to extend their tier two visas will be granted an extension under the skilled worker route and those who are already in the UK with a tier two visa will automatically um, qualify under the skilled worker route and they won't have to go and do anything to their visa um, to update it until the point of extension. So nothing will change um, in terms of the visa held for those individuals. On the next slide, um, we have there an overview of the key changes that are in place. So there are quite a number of them um, and I'll run through them quickly uh, just now for anyone that isn't familiar. So the first kind of key change is it will be a single set of rules for Europeans and other nationals um, under the new system. For those of you that are familiar with the current points-based system, you'll know that it's only highly skilled roles that are currently sponsorable. So that's RQF level six, which is graduate level and above but under the new rules coming into force on the 1st of December it will be medium skilled roles that are eligible for sponsorship so that's RQF level 3 which is broadly A level Scottish higher level. The minimum salary threshold will also be reduced to £25,600 um, and I'll come on to talk about that later on a separate slide. Um, also important to note that what is included for the purposes of uh, the minimum salary will change. So currently you can include certain allowances and guaranteed bonuses, but that will not be the case from the 1st of December and it will only be basic pay. So important to be aware of that. One of the key changes is that um, there will be no resident labour market tests. So currently uh, under the tier two rules, you have to advertise a role in a very specific way for a minimum of 28 days uh, to show that there's no settled worker that's British or European worker that can do the job for you and you have to hire a, a migrant worker. That's falling away from the 1st of December. So that's good news for employers as it will save up to four weeks worth of time when you would have to be running that advert. So that's welcome news. Um, there will also be no immigration cap. So currently there are rules in place which mean there's a limited number of certificates of sponsorship that the Home Office will issue each month 
and because they go through this this cap process there is only one opportunity to apply for a certificate of sponsorship um, if it's restricted each month so for some employers that means that you will be waiting up to four weeks because you have to wait to the next month's allocation meeting but that will not be the case under the new rules which is good news um, and restricted and unrestricted Restricted certificates of sponsorship will be replaced with what uh, are being called defined and undefined certificates of sponsorship, but I'll come on to talk about that separately in a minute. Um, another important thing to be aware of is that there will be no specific rules for high earners. So currently under the tier two rules, there are some preferential um, treatment for those workers, but given that the resident labour market test is being abolished generally um, across the board, those benefits will no longer apply as they won't apply to anyone at all. Um, there will also be no maximum period of leave under the skilled worker route. So for those uh, who are familiar with the system, there's a six year maximum time to be spent in the tier two uh, general category, but that will no longer be the case, which is good news. Um, the maintenance requirement, which is going to be called the financial requirement from the 1st of December, is also changing. So this is a requirement for migrant workers to evidence they have access to a specific amount of funds to support themselves in their first month in the UK. Um, that amount is increasing, so it's currently £945, but will be £1,270 from the 1st of December. Um, it's important for employers just to know about that because some employers uh, certify maintenance for their workers, so that means that when you sign a certificate of sponsorship, you're guaranteeing that if the migrant worker needs access to those funds, you will provide it as an employer. Um, so if you certify the maintenance, it's worth being aware that you're certifying for a higher amount from the 1st of December. Um, there's also going to be no exclusion for shareholders who own more than 10% of the shares in their sponsor. So currently, if you own um, more than 10% of shares in the company, that is going to sponsor you, you're not eligible for sponsorship, eh, but that will no longer be the case in the 1st of December. And the cooling off periods, which currently exist, which eh, mean that you have to spend around 12 months, usually outside of the UK, after you've had a tier two visa, will no longer apply. So that's also good news. And those changes are generally about the skilled worker route. Um, in terms of intra-company transfer, that will continue to exist but it, and it will remain broadly the same but there will be some uh, changes so one of the key ones being that you'll be able to switch from the intra-company route into the skilled worker route which means these individuals will have an ability to settle in the UK if they want to do that. Um, the ICT route is going under a general review at the moment and we're expecting feedback on that in the autumn of 2021 so there may be changes to come uh, at a future date in relation to that category. So on the next slide, um, I said I would come back to talk about the difference between a defined and undefined cost. So this is the new terminology being used by UKVI. Um, simply, a defined cost is for those migrant workers who are outside of the UK and applying from, for entry credence from overseas. Um, if that is the case, then the employer must apply for a defined certificate of sponsorship. And these are applied for on an as-needed basis. So you'll have to have identified a worker and be able to provide details about them and you will apply for them on the sponsor management system. Um, UKBI have specified that they will aim to give decisions on those costs within one working day. Um, for those who are inside the UK or those coming to the UK on an intercompany transfer visa, it will be an undefined certificate of sponsorship that uh, an employer needs to obtain for those individuals. Um, you will, as an employer, if you have a license, you will receive an annual allocation of that type of uh, certificate of sponsorship based on past usage and anticipated usage for the coming year. Um, if you have one available to use, you will simply assign that to the individual. If you have run out uh, and unexpectedly need to sponsor someone new, you can apply to increase that allocation throughout the year. Um, it's important to be aware of the difference between the certificates of sponsorship and when you will need to apply for each because assigning the wrong type can result in serious action from UKVI, including the revocation of your licence. So if you're ever unsure, it's always best to check the guidance and make sure you know the difference and that you're assigning the correct one for the worker you have in mind. Um, the next slide also talks about the minimum salary. 
So as I mentioned, the minimum salary is generally being reduced to 25,600. It's currently 30,000 uh, under the current rules, but there will be four circumstances where it may be possible to pay a migrant worker less. So it's important to be aware of those circumstances because you may think you can't sponsor someone because you don't meet that uh, minimum salary requirement, but actually you may be eligible if you can pay them a bit less in some circumstances. So the main circumstances where this applies are where the role is in a shortage occupation, where the candidate has a PhD in a subject relevant to the role, or where they have a PhD in a STEM, STEM subject relevant to the role, and also where the candidate, candidate is where what we call a new entrant, and that's a defined term in the guidance, so worth making sure whether that definition applies or not. And as you can see on the slide there, depending on the particular circumstances, the threshold for minimum salary can vary. So always worth double checking that um, before you rule out sponsorship. And finally, um, this is not a change, but is an important thing to be aware of. So the genuine vacancy requirement will continue to be uh, in play. When you assign a certificate of sponsorship, you are guaranteeing to UKVI that the role which you're going to sponsor is genuine so it is a real job and there is a real vacancy there. UKVI can uh, refuse your application if they have grounds to believe that the job either doesn't exist, is a sham or has been created just to facilitate either the ability to stay in the UK or entry to the UK for that individual. So that's always been the case and is the case just now but worth just being aware that that requirement will still be there and that is what you're kind of guaranteeing when you assign a certificate of sponsorship. So that's a quick overview of the new rules. I'm now going to pass over to Elaine who will um, talk about what this means practically for your business. Thanks, Erin. So yes, now you've had the overview and what's changing, we thought it'd be helpful to take a practical look at the impact that these changes may have on certain recruitment practices. And I'm going to start with the impact of the end of the Brexit transition period. So the end of the Brexit transition period is the cutoff date for eligibility for the EU settlement scheme and the EEA nationals have to be resident in the UK before the 31st of December this year in order to be eligible. There's then a grace period that they've got to apply up until the 30th of June next year. So in the period from January until June next year, it won't always be evident which employees will be eligible to work in the UK in the longer term and which won't, as employers might not know when somebody arrived in the UK or when they became resident in the UK and whether it was before or after that cutoff date of the 31st of December. And we've been asked by some employers whether they should ask job applicants if they've applied under the EU settlement scheme and if so, what the outcome is. And the Home Office website states that job applicants shouldn't be excluded from jobs on the basis that they haven't yet applied through the settlement scheme and that they're not under a duty to tell the employer if they've applied or what the outcome of that is, um, because I guess the cutoff date for them having to apply hasn't yet passed. There's also a duty um, which the Home Office website sets out not to discriminate against EU citizens in light of the decision to leave the EU. So that's a specific protection under the withdrawal agreement. And it says that offers of employment sh shouldn't therefore be conditional on the individual having applied through the settlement scheme. The Home Office um, guidance also states that employers should not check if um, their job applicants or employees have applied, but they've since clarified that that, that doesn't mean that employers cannot ask if somebody's applied through the settlement scheme, but that they should take care not to discriminate against them. So right to work checks then are not likely to change until June next year, um, but when they do change, they may not be retrospective and they may not require employers to go back and check those EEA nationals and whether they've been granted permission through the settlement scheme or when they became resident within the UK. But until those rules change, an EU passport is still sufficient for right to work purposes and there is no onus on the employer to check if an employee will have an ongoing right to work beyond June 2021 or to check when they became resident in the UK and whether they may therefore potentially qualify for the settlement scheme. So the recommendation in relation to European nationals is to ensure that your recruitment practices aren't unfairly excluding them by going above and beyond what an employer is required to do and also to watch this space for right to work checks. 
So uh, the next issue I'm going to cover, which is on the slide here, is the potential for race discrimination claims if applicants are excluded from the recruitment process based on their immigration status. And this issue has become more prominent, I think, as a result of the removal of the resident labour market test that Erin mentioned earlier. So there's been a code of practice for employers on avoiding discrimination whilst preventing illegal working for many years. So it's not a brand new uh, consideration. That code of practice basically states that employers should carry out right to work checks at the same stage of the recruitment process for everyone, regardless of their race or nationality, and that assumptions shouldn't be made, made based on somebody's race or accent, etc. This also suggests that employers should only ask for information about immigration status where it's necessary, and that's to avoid um, race discrimination issues arising. Many employers will, of course, make inquiries about whether individuals have got work in the UK either at the stage of an online application form or at some other stage through the recruitment process and some might then exclude candidates from roles based on them either not having the right to work or if the employer considers that they may not be able to obtain a right to work and in some cases the reason might be that the employer just simply doesn't have a sponsor license or it might be based on the fact that the job's not eligible for sponsorship due to the skills level or salary level. And in other cases, employers may exclude some candidates based on factors such as the cost of sponsorship being high. So it's worth considering your own recruitment practices. For example, what is your policy on sponsorship for certain jobs? Is the correct information being asked about immigration status in light of the new rules? And if so, when, for example, are you asking questions about whether somebody currently has the right to work or are you considering also whether they could obtain a right to work based, um, based on the new rules? And if anyone is being excluded, is there a justification for that policy? Um, and it's been estimated that around double the number of jobs will be eligible for sponsorship under the new rules as compared to uh, the ones in place prior to the 1st of December. So it's likely, I think, that this issue about uh, risk, the risk of race discrimination claims will become more relevant for employers. And in terms of the resident labour market test being abolished, if all that matters in the new rules is whether the job's eligible for sponsorship in terms of the skills and salary threshold, um, and there's no resident labour market test to satisfy, it's possible that we might see eligible workers challenging decisions to exclude them from jobs um, based on their immigration status more now uh, than ever before. In the next slide, I thought it'd be helpful to touch on the case of Osborne Clark and Purohit. And perhaps surprisingly, there aren't more cases on this risk of race discrimination claims in relation to immigration status. Um, but this is one of the sort of few reported cases in the area. And it dates back to 2009, so it's now, um, yeah, quite a few years old and was decided under older immigration rules even before there are current points-based system when there was a work permit scheme in place but some of the principles are still relevant to the issues that we're talking about today. So in that case the employer had a policy of not considering anyone for a trainee solicitor job um, if they required a work permit to work in the UK so they only considered I guess EEA nationals um, and UK nationals and Mr Purohit was an Indian national and he was therefore a member of that racial group, non-EEA nationals, who was impacted by that policy of excluding people who needed a work permit. He applied for the job through an online application process and was excluded. And the employer was basically sifting out those who didn't have permission to work in the UK. And the reason for that was that they received several hundred applications, I think around 300 for only 26 jobs. And their position was that because there was a resident labour market test requirement in place, they didn't think they would be able to meet it. Um, and they therefore sifted out those applications at that early stage in the recruitment process. And Mr. Purohit was successful in his claim of indirect race discrimination. Um, and the reason was that the policy impacted non ee nationals who couldn't work in the UK without a work permit. Um, and the proportion of non ee nationals impacted by that policy was um, was significant significantly worse obviously than than for those not in that group and the employer couldn't objectively justify the requirement um, that individuals didn't need a 
a work permit, I guess, to be taken through their um, recruitment process. And in that case, even though the resident labour market test was in place at that time, the employer had made untested assumptions that they couldn't satisfy it and they hadn't made efforts to obtain a work permit, etc. So that's where they fell down on that objective justification. Um, but I suppose in terms of lessons to learn from this case, there is that potential for an indirect race discrimination claim to be raised, even if the employer doesn't specifically exclude based on race or nationality, that might have um, a policy, for example, of excluding anyone who doesn't automatically have the right to work in the UK could adversely impact people of a certain race or nationality, um, and in which case it's then for the employer to objectively justify a policy of that sort. So the potential for indirect race discrimination claim has been there even under the old immigration rules. But I think this risk may come to the fore now because under the new rules, there isn't that built in requirement for employers to prefer a settled worker over a non settled worker in the same way. And any decision not to sponsor somebody for a job which is suitable for sponsorship in terms of the skills level may have to be justified. So I do think it's sensible for employers to consider in their recruitment practices. Um, what their policy on this will be, what potential objective justifications there may be, and also to consider the cost implications of sponsorship if they're going to be sponsoring an increased uh, number of, of people. And it's worth bearing in mind that some of the case, case law on objective justification for race discrimination um, supports the view that cost alone is unlikely in, in some cases, in any case, to um, justify a discriminatory policy, but employers should take their own advice on um, potential objective justifications. So I'm now going to move on to the new graduate route and the implications of that for recruitment practices. This is a new visa route which is opening up for those who are graduating in the summer of 2021 onwards if they've completed a degree at undergraduate level or above in the UK. And that will allow those individuals to stay and work or look for work if they don't yet have a job for two years in most cases or three years if they've got a PhD and they'll be able to switch into the skilled worker route once they find a job. So in terms of the implications for recruitment processes, employers can anticipate a higher number of applicants, uh, applications from international students in the UK because they're going to find it easier to stay to look for work after their studies. Um, whereas previously they would have had to have left the UK if they hadn't found a job or an employer to sponsor them before their visa expired. And for those of you who've been uh, around for a while, you'll remember the, there used to be a post-study work visa, um, which was then abolished. And, and this is um, a newly uh, created post-study work visa under a new um, name. So employers shouldn't uh, or should ensure that they're not excluding applicants who could qualify for this graduate visa, even if they haven't already got one. So if you're just asking questions about whether somebody actively has permission to work in the UK, we were thinking about um, those people who could potentially qualify for a graduate visa in the future. And they should ensure that they're asking the right questions about visas and application forms and during shortlisting processes. And employers might want to consider what to do if They've got graduate training schemes, for example, which might be, say, three years, um, even if individuals have just got a graduate route visa for a period of two years, um, and whether they may have to factor in the cost of sponsoring those individuals um, at the end of their visa. I'm now going to talk about uh, recruitment practices and internships because we've had a few questions from clients about how they can deal with visas for their interns and also graduate training programmes. And for employers who've historically recruited from the EU, this has been a straightforward process in the past with no work permit considerations or costs. Um, so going forward, there are some options to consider, which I'll just run through. We mentioned earlier that the intercompany transfer route remains in place. There's a subcategory of that for graduate trainees, which may be suitable for some graduate training programmes. This is for those who will take part in a structured graduate training programme where they're being transferred from an overseas group company to the UK. So it may be suitable for some organisations, but not for others. Um, and there is generally a requirement for three month service overseas, and there's generally a minimum salary requirement of 23,000 for that role or 70% of the going rate for the job. Another option to consider is one of the 
newly branded temporary worker routes. These used to be called tier five routes, which might be suitable for certain short term periods of working in the UK. Um, some of these are specialist programmes with specific criteria, but one route which might be of interest for those seeking to employ interns, etc., is the BUNAC scheme. So that's suitable for those who want to work in the UK for up to six months, provided that they're recent graduates. Um, and in addition, the employer needs to be approved by BUNAC, which acts as a sponsor for those individuals. Um, and the next slide. Um, yeah, just to mention that visit visas are unlikely to be suitable for either graduate programmes or internships because the rules specifically exclude those um, on work placements or internships. But other options to consider are the graduate route that I mentioned or the standard uh, skilled worker route, which Erin outlined earlier, which will be much easier than it was before because there would be no resident labour market test to satisfy and no cooling off periods to worry about if individuals are going to go back um, out from the UK and, and want to come back in the future. Um, so they, those routes may be more suitable in the future. And then the other temporary worker routes, such as youth mobility, which will still exist under the new rules. So we've got a few minutes now for some questions. If you do have questions, please do use the Q&A box. Um, if we don't have time to get through all of those today, we will hopefully be able to follow up with people. If you want to put your name beside it, we'll know who's asked the question. Um, Erin, have you got any questions coming through there? Yeah, so we've had one come in asking, should we be checking our current employee status for the settlement scheme either now or after June 2021? Um, so employers don't need to check um, that their employees have applied through the settlement scheme right now. They've still got this grace period until June 2021 to apply. It's likely that um, there will then be changes to the right to work check rules, um, at which point employers will have to obviously comply with those. But yes, the answer is you don't have to do that just now. Lots of employers, however, are going out there, I suppose, encouraging their staff to apply through the settlement scheme, and that's definitely a good idea. Um, they don't want to be, or you don't want to have your staff running up against that deadline, not having got their paperwork in place, um, because just now, for example, if they got refused, they could reapply again, and there would be no impact on them in the meantime, if they wait right until, um, you know, towards June, that June deadline to apply and they get refused, they could become illegal and, um, and that could have much more serious repercussions for them. So encouraging them is a good idea. Great. Um, yeah, we've had a couple more. So will there be any other changes to costs for the process, for example, the health surcharge? So the immigration health surcharge changed in October um, to £624 per person per year of the visa. Um, I suppose the major change in relation to that is that European nationals will also uh, have to pay that from the 1st of January if they're entering the UK on or after that date. So that'll be a significant cost implication for people coming and it's a, a reason why you might want to come before the uh, 31st of December this year to avoid those costs in the future but there are no future changes to that um, anticipated because the rules have just recently been changed. Um, we've had another one so will the job description not be taken into consideration at all with the new points based system apart from the information required for certificate sponsorship application? Um, so the job description is relevant in that, I suppose, under the new rules, a job still needs to be sufficiently skilled in order to be eligible for sponsorship. Um, and the employer still has the job of matching up the, the role that they've got in their organisation with one of the job codes on UK Visas and Immigration's website, checking that it is a good match and checking that it is one of the jobs that's suitable for sponsorship under the new rules. Um, and under the current record keeping requirements, employers are obliged to keep a sort of detailed job description on file. Um, I think we're still waiting for the updated um, list of documents that require to be kept under the new rules. Um, the last time we looked in the last day or two, it hadn't been updated yet. So um, I would say consult the uh, record keeping requirements under the new rules which will be available on UKBI's website to see what information needs to be retained. Um, there's a question here for you Erin, what does sufficiently skilled for sponsorship mean? 
So UKVI set out the eligibility for sponsorship um, under the new rules based on skill level and salary. Um, as I mentioned, there's a change to the skill level. So when we say sufficiently skilled, we mean that the role meets that level. At the moment, the, the, uh, so under the current rules, the skill level is level six or highly skilled, which is kind of graduate level roles. From the 1st of December, when the new rules come into play, that will be a uh, level three, and that's a uh, medium skilled roles. So that's kind of roles to A level, Scottish higher qualification and above. Um, but there's detailed guidance about the job codes that UKBI determine are eligible for sponsorship. So um, if in doubt, that's the place to have a look at is in with all the job codes. Yeah, so UKVI will um, set out which jobs are suitable and which are not. So for example, if you were thinking of a, a human resources role, you would search the job codes, match up the job description uh, of the job that you're looking to sponsor, sponsor for and um, check what the suitable job code is for that. It will specify what the minimum salary level is. Um, and that will tell you on that list if it's considered to be su uh, sufficiently skilled or not. Um, let's see. So there's a question here. Do the applications still only get picked up once a month, for example, on the 5th and decided by the 11th? I think that's asking about the process for uh, what will now be uh, defined and undefined certificates of sponsorship. Do you want to take that one, Erin? Yep. Yeah, so... Um... I guess under the current rules, there's an immigration cap, and that's why there's a monthly meeting to allocate uh, certificates of sponsorship, which is why you have to have restricted applications in by the 5th and decided by the 11th. Under the new rules, there won't be a cap and there won't be that monthly allocation decision any longer. So you will be able to make applications as and when needed for defined certificates of sponsorship. And the UKBI have said they'll get them back within one working day, which is different to the apply by the 5th and find out by the 11th. So you won't have to kind of wait that period any longer. You can just apply as and when needed for the defined certificates of sponsorship. Yeah, and it's worth saying that there's a different process in place um, whereby you can apply for an annual allocation on your licence of the undefined uh, certificates of sponsorship and if UKVI don't give you any you'll be able to still apply throughout the year but that some um, I guess under the current rules that's sometimes taken several weeks but they've introduced a sort of priority service to speed up um, that process but you have to pay extra for it so it remains to be seen I think whether they will repeat that priority service for um, for the other type of certificate sponsorship. Um, but I'm just looking at the time there. It's probably a good time to wrap up. If you've got additional questions that you think of afterwards, please do email us and we can come back to you directly on those. But uh, otherwise, thanks for joining.